I'm ITV's Judge Rinder. I've been a criminal barrister for over a decade. I'm going to be examining cases that have shocked the nation. On today's programme, a London gang planned the biggest diamond robbery in criminal history. £200 million worth of the finest jewel any have ever seen in the world, plus a load of blue diamonds. We'd identified that uh, Millennium Dome was liable to be the target. The police did not know the exact plan. They knew they had the G JCB and it had been modified, potentially to ram something, and they knew they had the speedboats. But can the police stop them before they reach their target? We're looking on the cameras and we see them starting to make their attack run and they penetrate the outer skin of the dome. An explosion of noise as it smashed through the Perspex door and of arriving with a shock value. And later, an innocent man loses his freedom. He walked up to the vehicle and a bunch of policemen jumped out and arrested him. The men shoot drugs, that put the fear of death into me. This is Judge Rinder's crime story. It's rare to read about a case that will immediately make you think about a Hollywood movie. However, over a decade ago, there was a crime that was so audacious that it could have been written directly for the cinema. In November 2000, a group of experienced and organized criminals attempted one of the most extraordinary robberies in British criminal history. The target, the world's most perfect diamond, the De Beers Millennium Star. Would the robbers be in for a lifetime of untold riches or years behind bars? This is the case of the Dome Raiders. London in the year 2000, where a spate of aborted armed robberies in and around the capital has come to the attention of the authorities. The police were investigating a series of armed robberies, um, which had the same modus operandi, which, was, which involved a, uh, a specially modified truck uh, ramming um, cash in transit. Vans. Uh, the first robbery was where a security vehicle was delivering in the Nine Elms area when masked raiders, of which there were approximately about 10, I believe, uh, cornered the vehicle and started ramming the back of it with what was uh, a large sort of homemade spike. It was a meticulously planned operation, but what they'd uh, failed to appreciate was that the lorry with the ram um, had managed to block in a motorist who had no idea what they were planning and was so angry at his car being blocked in that he pinched the, the lorry's keys, threw them away, so they had to abort the whole operation uh, on the spot. And that was when they made their getaway. And at that point in time, they then made good their escape across the road into a powerboat down on the river. and straight down the Thames as a getaway. It was all very theatrical, it was all very audacious, and it showed elements of ruthlessness that meant this gang had to be caught. After a second failed attempt in Aylesford in Kent on the 7th of July, it was clear that these criminals had to be stopped and fast. The common denominator on both robbies had been the level of force used, the spike. Uh, the also common denominator was the, the river getaway. It was then decided by the powers that be at Scotland Yard that because I was in charge of the flying squad based at Tower Bridge, uh, because we effectively had the Thames as part of our remit, that I would actually take on board the operation. With the world-famous flying squad now on board, this was the start of Operation Magician. But with no idea who the gang members were and where they might strike next, the team had a very difficult job ahead. From my perspective, we started to research and try and gather intelligence on the gang, which was very, very slow coming out of the criminal fraternity. Uh, and we started to research targets that potentially had links to this, uh, the waterway, as it were. Four days later, they finally made some progress. The breakthrough point for, uh, for the operation, from my perspective, was being contacted by a young police constable down in Kent. 
He had been monitoring as a total independent operation. The Kent police contacted Scotland Yard after they'd spotted a vehicle used in the Aylesford Arm robbery at the farm they were monitoring. And from that point on, we then conducted intelligence gathering around Tong Farm, which started to identify various people. The first one who we identified was somebody called Lee Wenham. And on one particular occasion, we noticed uh, a black Range Rover turn up. Uh, from that moment in time, Wenham changed his persona. And when he went to greet the member of the Range Rover, he greeted them uh, in a way that you could only describe as he was reverent toward them. And that individual who got out the Range Rover was Betson with his number two, Cochran, William Cochran. They were quickly identified by us as being the key players. The leader of the gang was uh, Raymond Betson. He was a, a career criminal. I mean, he was a smart guy. Um, he'd been involved in various crimes that he'd admitted to and been convicted of. We did identify him. We realised we were dealing with a professional criminal with substantive links to the underworld. Uh, the manner in which he conducted his life, the manner in which he conducted himself, yeah, told us that you know, this was the real deal, as it were. Surveillance of the farm ensured that the entire gang and their movements were continuously being watched. But even before the police had identified the main gang members, by late August 2000, one person had already alerted them to the potential target. Lee Wenham to us was the weak link in that he wasn't at the same level of professionalism and therefore he was making mistakes that we could exploit. Follow this face, see where it took them, and he took them to the Millennium Dome. He paid a lot of attention to what was going on in the vault to the point where he was actually looking to identify cameras, security and what have you. The very fact that he was on the southern tip of the, uh, of the Thames um, meant they could use one of their favourite getaway routes, which was a fast speedboat across the water to the north bank, where they hoped that uh, they could just get away clean away. With a getaway route next to the Thames, it became clear that the gang's next target was a Millennium Dome. Or more specifically, the bounty it held within, a diamond called the Millennium Star. 200 million pounds were for the finest jewel any have ever seen in the world, plus a load of blue diamonds, uh, which were just uh, of uh, sensational value, uh, put on exhibition by De Beers at the Millennium Dome. The famous diamond company had loaned this magnificent stone and 11 blue diamonds to the dome to go on display during the millennium year. And Tim Thorne was De Beers' head of security at the time. Having set up the, uh, the display in the Millennium Dome, which required a lot of hard work, because we had to build basically um, a pillbox. It was a concrete structured uh, hexagonal shaped uh, display unit with large um, and very thick and wide uh, vault doors, two of them, one for entrance, one for exit, and also for the fire safety reasons. Uh, and inside there were all the sort of uh, detection devices you can possibly think of were put in there, including cameras, listening devices, etc. The police now knew the target and the criminals involved, but what they did not know is how and when they would strike. We didn't know if they were going to try and do it whilst the dome was open or whether it was going to be done in the evening. Um, we didn't know if it might involve a kidnap of a guard or something. So there was a hundred different scenarios that could have happened. And it was our job in the Metropolitan Police to actually deal with each of those scenarios and have a plan for it. The network of partners that we built up to help us, that included the military, it included Thor, Mr. Tim Thorne at De Beers, it included the Kent Police, it included the River Police, it included the Dome Security. We all worked together and we all established key people who could keep a secret and actually all help us towards the final day. De Beers were a key player in helping advise the police. The first time I met Mr. Thorne, uh, we'd identified that the uh, Millennium Dome was liable to be the target and we needed to actually know um, um, how things worked around the actual diamond, the security-wise, because it was only by identifying those areas that we were able to come to a plan as to what would happen. So I went up with Mr John Shapford, who was my uh, detective superintendent, and we were shown into Mr Thorne's office 
And he said, well, I've got some bad news for you. We have information that it's likely there could be an attack to try and steal those diamonds. And I don't wish you to tell anybody else because really and truly we want to make this as covert as possible and to capture the robbers if they are tried to steal it. Mr Thorne was uh, reassuring in that he told me that there is no way that they could steal this diamond, that the level of security was such that uh, they couldn't penetrate the vault even if they uh, rammed it with a, uh, an articulated vehicle. He told me that the glass case was impervious to assault and that it had been tested to withstand a 30-minute assault using oxyacetylene. I had been told that they couldn't be broken after half an hour of a demented man slashing it with either an axe, a long-handled axe, or a 12-pound sledgehammer, or 16-pound sledgehammer. It would not break for at least half an hour, which to my mind was satisfactory because by then the 6th Cavalry would have arrived. But these were a gang of criminals hell-bent on carrying out their master plan. So there remained a possibility that even the significant security in place would not be able to stop the priceless hall from falling into the wrong hands. The Metropolitan Police and their world-famous flying squad were on high alert. With an estimated quarter of a billion pounds worth of diamonds on the line, along with public safety within the Millennium Dome, when the time came, they would have to act fast. But would Raymond Betson and his gang manage to be one step ahead of them? After the break, the time comes for the gang to strike. What was the, the most sensational aspect of it was that they were going to drive JCP Digger up the road through London traffic, past all the CCTV that uh, uh, you could imagine. We'd actually watched them for about 30 miles that morning and they, got, get, got, they were getting closer and closer at each stage. But would the flying squad be able to foil their plans? The police still didn't know what they were going to do exactly. You can hear them on the surveillance video saying, are they going to ram it? Are they going to ram it? In the year 2000, the Metropolitan Police and their world-famous flying squad discovered that a gang of professional criminals, led by a man called Raymond Betson, were intent on stealing diamonds worth 250 million pounds from the Millennium Dome. What they did not know was how or when they would strike. The wait was now on. The police had been assured that the diamonds, which included the 203-carat Millennium Star, were well protected but they weren't taking any chances. They continued their surveillance operation so that when the time came, they were prepared for whatever the gang had in mind. We were watching them for around about 100 days. We were then able to focus in to actually see what the um, issues were around stealing it. And we were able to identify that there was only a 30 minute window of opportunity that they had every day when the tide was right to actually get close to the dome to execute their escape. Uh, because of that, we were able to then close down our planning as well. Uh, other elements were the times that the vault opened, uh, because it became obvious that they wouldn't be able to attack when the vault was closed, so it had to be when it was open. Along with a speedboat, the police had also become aware that a JCB may somehow be used in the plot. We'd identified where the boat was. We'd also identified where the JCB was, and they were many, many miles away. So our operation at that time focused on monitoring those two items of equipment because they were intrinsic to the operation. The wait must have been excruciating for the police um, and because it took so long, and they didn't know which day they were going to strike. Um, they just could see they were getting closer and closer. 
and it was looking more and more likely that the date was, was approaching and uh, the pressure really was on to get this right. We were fortunate, we knew where they were going to strike and we had control to be able to protect the community and the public when they did this. Yeah. If they changed targets and gone somewhere that we didn't know, then other people would have been at risk. So for me, the, 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 the whole purpose of the operation was keeping the integrity of it, keeping in the shadows, keeping in the background, so that we're, they were going to be very, very surprised when we did actually jump out on them. Three months after the start of Operation Magician on the 7th of November 2000, it looked like the wait was finally over. On the morning of the 7th of November, we commenced our observations as we had done on other days when we got an indication early in the morning that those vehicles were on the move. What was the, the most sensational aspect of it was that they were going to drive JCP Digger three miles up the road through London traffic, past all the CCTV that uh, uh, you could imagine uh, in place on the London roads, um, arriving at uh, the Millennium Dome at 9.30 in the morning. It was the early, early part of the day. It was opening. People were arriving. Uh, we had armed officers who were dressed as cleaners. Some were dressed as tour guides. Well, I, I was in the control room at the Millennium Dome, and we were receiving live intelligence as their approach to the dome was getting nearer. The getaway boat was in position on the Thames, and as a JCB neared the dome, the police were shocked by the events that happened next. The vehicle itself uh, accelerated at quite a high speed uh, down the hill towards the Millennium Dome, and then it turns sharp left and breaks through into uh, the outskirts and fencing that can protect the dome. Still didn't know uh, what they were going to do exactly. Um, and I think, again, you can hear them on the surveillance video um, saying, are they going to ram it? Are they going to ram it? And sure enough, that's what Betson does, he drives into the dome. He floored, absolutely just floored the JCB, so got it up to as high speed as possible and just tore apart the, the door shutter, flew inside. An explosion of noise as it smashed through the Perspex door uh, and arriving with a shock value. But they had also arrived with uh, gas masks, with uh, stink bombs, with uh, all sorts of aids or tools or uh, effects to create panic amongst the, the people who were there, to keep out of their way. The plan was to smash down the, uh, the toughened glass, grab the loot, and be gone away across the water in just five minutes. And what they effectively did was they used a nail gun to create a pressure effect in the glass that then caused it to splinter and then they use sledgehammers then just to take the splinter apart. I'd still had the words of Mr Thorne in my ear that it would have took 30 minutes with an oxyacetylene gas torch. I think when I review the video, it took something like 20 seconds. The nail gun was a frightening implement. Um, it was used in industrial circumstances to fix nails into concrete. So you imagine the power that was, that it could emanate, and it used a sort of explosive charge to create the, the hole in the toughened glass. They created a hole the size of a dinner plate within about 20 seconds. The gang were only moments away from pulling off the perfect crime and getting away with what detectives say would have been the biggest diamond robbery in criminal history. At that moment, uh, the police arrived en masse, uh, the, the flying squad, all in their uh, black gear with their masks on and everything else, and they threw in some stun grenades. And uh, I can tell you from listening on the earphones, their noise was absolutely unbelievable. And these two robbers were immediately blown onto their backs, and they lay there as the police came in, uh, and then obviously eventually arrested them. Takeout operation, for want of a better word, was over in seconds. And the reality was it had been planned to perfection, and they thought they were 100% safe at getting away with this job. You know, the fact that the flying squad, who are, who do have the reputation as being, 
you know, an elite unit were actually there to stop them must have come as a hell of a shock for them. The remaining gang members outside the dome were also arrested, including Kevin Meredith, the boatman on standby for their river escape. Obviously, instead of the diamond geezers getting away with the crime of the century and selling the diamonds for a million quid, they were on their way to some very serious time in prison. And then the hard work of preparing the case for court began. Uh, we were happy that there were no outstanding members of the gang, that we'd arrested everybody. We were happy that the principals had been arrested. The case came to trial almost exactly a year later, on the 8th of November 2001, at the Old Bailey. Journalist Paul Cheston was present throughout the hearing. It would be one of the great trials. Not only were we looking at what could have been the biggest robbery in the world's history of crime, uh, but it was at one of the most controversial landmarks in London at that time. And it was one of those trials. People wanted to read about the extraordinary brilliance of criminal planning and extraordinary brilliance of the Flying Squad to cover every aspect of it and be there and nick them absolutely red-handed. And so much of it caught on, on TV, uh, on CCTV, that could be played in court to the jury to show them what had actually happened. The five main culprits were to stand trial. Well, Betson was the leader of the gang, and as such, he was driving, for want of a better word, the tank on the day, which was a JCB. Sitting beside him was Shiroki. Now, Shiroki was uh, a white-collar gang member, but he was the money man who'd arranged a lot of the infrastructure that they needed. Uh, inside the actual dome itself, attacking the vault, you've got Adams, yeah, and you've got Cochran. Cochram was Betson's number two in the criminal world, and Adams was an old lag criminal, well trusted, and had been out there for many, many years. And then finally, there was Meredith. Meredith was the boatman. He was going to be there to grab uh, the robbers as they escaped, ferry them across the Thames. And the issue, of course, was not did they do it, but were they using enough or sufficient violence to merit a robbery charge and a prison sentence that would be three or four times larger than if the, uh, if it had just been a conspiracy to attempt to steal, which is what they pleaded guilty to. Now, armed robbery involves threat or intimidation with a weapon, you know, so that a person feels sufficiently scared of physical harm or in danger of their life, which is what um, one witness said, I could have been killed when the JCB crashed um, through the shutter. They were dressed like paramilitaries on the day. They had respirators, they were dressed in black. Uh, they had water pistols that looked like machine guns that were full of ammonia. Uh, their defense around that was that they were going to use the ammonia to destroy uh, forensic evidence. But we were able to prove that the ammonia was at such a strength that if it had been gone in the eyes of a member of the public or something, it would have caused temporary or permanent blindness. Now, the dying geese argued that we weren't carrying weapons. You know, we didn't go armed. OK, we crashed into the dome, you know, but we didn't want to cause anyone any harm. We weren't going to spray anyone in the face with ammonia. We weren't going to hit anyone with a hammer. We just wanted to get in and get out. All of this together for a bystander gave a terrifying spectacle that you would have thought it was something on the verge of a terrorist attack taking place. So the mere fact that they were playing the idea that uh, people would be frightened and not be there was just fallacy on their part. And they were just trying to minimise it down, but it didn't really hold water, and the jury saw that. Um, the judge did discount uh, the JCB, and he discounted the uh, ammonia, and he discounted the Hilti gun and the uh, hammer as weapons. Where he did say people were put in fear of their lives was the act of crashing into the dome. So crashing through the barrier on a JCB, um, that did put people in fear of their lives. After a three-month trial, four of the defendants were found guilty of conspiracy to commit robbery. Betson and Cochrane received 18 years in custody. Adams and Cherokee got 15, whilst boatman Meredith was cleared of this charge, but sentenced to five years for conspiracy to steal. There was one final twist revealed during the trial. Had the men been successful in their attempt, the jewels in their possession would have been virtually worthless. And so obviously once uh, De Beers were informed by the police that this 
you know, crime was likely to happen, they simply replaced the real diamonds with uh, fakes. I'm no great diamond expert, but I can assure you they were pretty good. And it was they were produced, they were uh, cubic zirconi, uh, not worth a great deal, probably about £2,000 uh, total in price, I mean, being made. And the problem here is that you should never ever display anything uh, unless you tell the public that this isn't the McCoy uh, object. And so we couldn't put a notice up saying to everybody, this is plastic, otherwise the robbers would see that as well. So they made a very bold decision to allow the thing to continue as the original stones, but in fact they weren't, and nobody knew about it. Ray Betson said uh, during the trial, uh, when this came out, he said, if, if I'd have known that, I wouldn't have bothered. So, there you go. <laughs> The Dome Raiders boasted that they would never be caught and prided themselves on their meticulous planning to keep them one step ahead of the law. But the flying squad was one step ahead of them. Lee Wenham was arrested at his farm on the same day as the raid, and at a separate case at the Old Bailey, he was sentenced to nine years after pleading guilty for participating in a conspiracy to the Aylesford attempted robbery. He was also sentenced to a concurrent four years after pleading guilty to conspiracy to steal in connection with the dome plot. And in January 2004, Betson, Cochram, and Chiarocci went to the Court of Appeal, where they won a challenge against their lengthy sentences. Betson and Cochram's sentences were reduced to 15 years, and Chiarocci's to 12. They intended to go down in history as a gang who pulled off the biggest and most audacious robbery of the millennium. Now, these were not high street chances. They had a sophisticated military-styled operation which they hoped would reap a multi-million pound reward. They failed. After the break, a man's perfect life is shattered. They charged him with concern and supply of drugs, which was amphetamines. Had a lovely job, lovely family. Everyone was, my life is great. All of a sudden, gone. This is a case that makes most law-abiding citizens terrified. As a criminal barrister, I'm sometimes asked what it's like to defend someone when I believe them to be guilty. Of course, people rarely inquire about the pressure a lawyer's under when he thinks that his client might be innocent. The answer is that there's nothing more offensive to the rule of law than when an innocent man goes to jail. In the case you're about to hear, Billy Stirrett had everything he ever wanted, a perfect family and his dream job as a gamekeeper. But in 2002, his life was literally turned upside down when that dream became a nightmare after the police named him as their prime suspect in an undercover drug operation, despite vehemently claiming to the authorities that they'd got the wrong man. Nobody would listen to him. The rugged uplands of Scotland, within which lies the beautiful village of Douglas, South Lanarkshire, and it was here on a 33,000-acre estate that Billy Stirrett had found his dream job. I left school, I worked on farms. Eventually, became a full-time gamekeeper. I applied for a job in Douglas and Angus Estate. I got the job, I was employed by Lord Hume. My life was fantastic. I was looking forward, looking forward to it every day. I had a, an eight-month-old girl, I had a two-and-a-half-year-old son, it was fantastic, in the country life, loved it. He really loved his job. He was always outdoors, always, you know, off doing his, his game keeping and uh, away in the hills. And uh, I think a lot of people don't understand that a gamekeeper is not just like a, 
it's not just a job, it's a vocation. It's something that you really have to want to do because you have to go out in all weathers, in the dark, in the rain, in the snow, everything. The job came with a house in the estate's grounds where the young family lived. And for Billy, life couldn't have been more perfect. I was always happy. I was happy and shouting at folk and laughing and carrying on. And, he'd take, and he loved it. He actually loved his job. Billy enjoyed carrying out his duties around the estate. And the 4th of March 2002 started out just like any other day. He'd been out and had a normal day at work, and his friend was coming down, and off they went up to uh, his ground to, to look for the, the foxes. Billy and his friend were deep into the estate land when Billy saw something suspicious. I was wa watching the, a small road go up past the river. I seen the headlights of a car, which I thought was a car, coming up the road. I said, Watch this, this will be poachers, because we never got anybody about in that area. This will be poachers. The vehicle passed up the road, slowly turned and come back down. I decided to go and see who, who it was. Nothing could have prepared Billy for what was about to happen. A bunch of policemen jumped out and arrested him. They took me from, from there to Lanark Police Station. I was sat in there for five or six hours in a cell before they, they interviewed me about five in the morning. I, they, they mentioned drugs, and I, then that put the fear of death into me. I didn't know what they were talking about. But what they said was drugs, 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 so I just declined to comment after that. I just said, no comment. Everything they asked me, no comment. My wife went down and said that the police had been lifted by for drugs. Couldn't take it in. Don't believe you went back. The police had been carrying out a surveillance operation 11 days earlier. In deep forest adjacent to the estate land where Billy worked, they had discovered an amphetamine cutting operation within some wooden huts. Whilst taking out the area, an hour prior to Billy's arrest, the police believed they had seen him put three black bags into the boot of his vehicle, drive for at least a kilometre to meet the driver of a second car to whom he handed over the bags. A police chase ensued, and when the second car crashed, the driver fled on foot, leaving police to find 50 kilograms of amphetamines in the boot with a street value of half a million pounds. They charged him with concern in the supply of drugs, which was amphetamines. Apparently, he handed over drugs to somebody else in a different car. That was the, that was the charge. But the police claimed that during their surveillance, they had more evidence of Billy's involvement in the drugs operation, dating back to the previous month. On the 6th of March, 2002, having been charged with the supply of Class B controlled drugs, he was taken to Barlini Prison in Glasgow. They put us in small boxes, which I think they'd be like four feet by four feet, a place you could sit, and a small slat in the window. And they were, it was a Friday night, they were roaring and shouting, they were people cursing and fights going on. Billy was kept in this holding cell for six hours before he was moved. I was put into a cell with somebody I'd never... He was a junkie. He was out his head, and I was just shoved in there. Billy's world had been turned upside down, still reeling from the shock, and after one week, he was released on bail pending trial. I had a lovely job, lovely family. Everything was... My life is great. All of a sudden, gone. Billy had an agonising two-year wait before his case came to trial on the 22nd of April 2004, where he came up against the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service, who were responsible for prosecuting crime in Scotland. His only hope of freedom was that the jury would believe his innocent plea. When I was in the dock, the Fiscal made out to the jury that I was some sort of monster. 
That was the big chap that killed all the wee furry animals, shot the deer, shot the rabbits, did this, did that, putting the jury right against me from the word go. The fiscal then puts it into their head, would you believe this man or would you believe a police officer here who has 23 years unblemished service? Who do you believe? After a series of police officers who had been attached to Scottish Drugs Enforcement gave evidence, the jury deliberated for one and a half days. They returned the worst outcome possible for Billy, a guilty verdict. I was devastated. I, I, my, my head was bursting. I didn't know what was happening to me. I'd never been in trouble before. And all of a sudden, I'm standing in Hamilton Street with a guilty verdict that came out of what? The judge released Billy until sentencing. Billy had his suspicions as to why. The judge knew there was something wrong with the conviction, and that's the reason why he let me out of court that day instead of taking us down the stair. He knew he wasn't a happy man, but if nothing, his hand was tied because it was a jury verdict. I had about two and a half, three weeks to get my home dismantled. Try and find someone for my kids, put, my wife and my kids was put in a refuge because I, I was in a tied house in that estate. And because I was found guilty by state law, if found guilty, you've, you've lost your job. They hit the kids and the mum had to get into a woman's aid and they threw them out of that house, a woman's aid, and we couldn't put them up either because we had no room. And it was heartbreaking to see them doing that. I had four dogs, I loved my dog, my animals. I managed, I was lucky enough to manage to house two of the pups, but the other two dogs was older. And in and and game keeping life, they'll not work for somebody else. So they had to be destroyed. The destroying part of me also. An innocent man found guilty of a crime he did not commit. Billy's life was unravelling before his eyes. Not only had he lost the job he loved, but also his home. His only hope now was the judge would show some leniency when sentencing. After the break, Billy receives his sentence. This is like, my God, how, how, how can this happen to me? It just collapsed. So it wasn't so no, no way, no way that's not happening. Just couldn't believe it. And begins his fight for justice. I would never let this go. I couldn't let it go. If you haven't done nothing wrong, why should I, why should I go away? In March 2002, gamekeeper Billy Stewart was arrested and charged for the supply of Class B controlled drugs. Despite pleading his innocence, Billy had been found guilty. As a result, he lost his job and his home, and he was awaiting to hear his fate as his sentencing date approached. On the 2nd of July 2004, two months after his trial, Billy returned to court for sentencing. What was up in? the house where his wife when we get the phone call to say how it gets six years. And it just collapsed. So it wasn't so no, no way. 
the way that's not happening. Just couldn't believe it. This was like, my God, how, how, how can this happen to me? I was put in Berlin jail. I was put two months, I would remove me again to Glenoco jail in Stirlingshire. My wife at the time had two small kids. She couldn't travel away up to Stirlingshire with kids to see me. I was devastated. If you're a person who's been out and about in the countryside and don't like crowds, it must be absolutely hell. Prisons know somewhere you want to go, believe me. <laughs> no. For a man who was very much at home with nature and the great outdoors, the confinement of prison was torment. Billy had lost everything, including his marriage. So he lost his wife, his job, his good name, the good name that he had. He lost everything. Sadly, Billy's relationship was yet another casualty of this miscarriage of justice. The pressures on Billy's wife grew. Along with raising two children, she had to cope with the whispers and questions on the outside, and eventually this became too much. Billy did eventually get some more positive news. He'd learnt that someone was questioning his conviction. Six months into the, to the sentence, a judge's report came in. The judge's report noted all the different things that the police did, did wrong. The judge at Billy's trial had been surprised by the verdict of the jury, but bound by the law, he'd had to pass down the sentence on Billy. He brought into question the credibility and reliability of much of the evidence from the officers of the Scottish Drugs Enforcement Agency. One point the judge questioned was the evidence from a single officer who, despite being on foot on the night of Billy's arrest, claimed to have witnessed Billy's movements that evening, including a kilometre-long car journey he supposedly made, ultimately putting into question Billy's guilt. The report was enough to secure his release, and after six months in prison, he was out, pending an appeal. When he came back out of there, he was a broken man anyway. He came back out, he had no house, he had no job, he had absolutely nothing at all. He was at rock bottom. When I came out of the jail, my sister kept me in her home. I tried to get somewhere to stay. She had a young family at the time, three, three small kids also. So they actually put me into that house. I felt really uncomfortable for, for putting a burden onto her. I think what this case exemplifies is how it can go so horribly wrong for somebody, even when they are innocent. His life was completely ruined. He, yes, he only served six months, but six months in prison is a really long time for somebody that's innocent. Life on the outside was tough for Billy. Although he did manage to find some happiness in a new relationship with girlfriend Kirsty, his name still hadn't been cleared, and a question mark remained over his innocence. Five and a half years I had to go about with people thinking I was a drug dealer. People whispering, behind your ear. Nobody wanted to, losing good friends. My main friends stayed with me, they knew. They knew me, they knew I would, I would never do that. Finally, in 2010, Billy's case went to the appeal court. When he had to go back to, um, to Edinburgh, when the, uh, when the judges were hearing the appeal, it was very, very low then. That was bad because he was absolutely terrified. Terrified. Uh, and so was I, that he'd go back to jail. That was very bad. He'd given me his chain before he went and he said, keep a hold of that till I get back. And I said, right, I'll give you it back this afternoon. And uh, thinking, oh, I hope it, I do. The appeal process had been delayed. According to Billy's defence team, requests to gain access to police materials from the case had been opposed by the chief constable, who was also the keeper of the records. Once the paperwork was eventually provided, it became clear that before the initial trial, a police officer had made two statements about supposed observations of Billy on the 21st of February 2002. These were inconsistent with evidence given at the trial itself. This, along with other inconsistencies in the evidence, was enough to persuade the appeal court that Billy's conviction should be quashed. 
If we had this evidence in the trial, it would have a completely different outlook. The initial elation of people actually believing you and saying, OK, yeah, we've got the evidence here and you didn't do this, the elation of that wears off quite quickly. And then he realises that he's got the rest of his life to live with people, lots of people still thinking that he is guilty and, you know, mud sticks. I never ever once got an apology for any, any of the police. I never get any chat ch at my door to say, look, there's been, there's been a miscarriage of justice here. Uh, we're sorry, something's happened, everything's human. Nothing. In 2015, Billy contacted the Miscarriage of Justice organisation and spoke with co-project manager Paul McLaughlin. Billy obviously has suffered uh, some health issues related to his wrongful conviction, and that's one of the issues our organisation is set up to deal with. So we try to uh, support him with ensuring that he gets adequate medical care and support uh, put in place. The, the medical issues that are, are created through wrongful imprisonment, most people that we deal with suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder. His conviction may have been quashed, but it wasn't the end of Billy's suffering. Billy Sturrett lost any ability to have the future that he wants to have for himself because Billy, Billy wants to go back to work. Billy wants to be able to undertake the job that gave him so much joy. He misses that. He misses the freedom of going out and, and doing that. He feels he's hemmed in. And that, I think that gets him, really gets him down. It makes him angry. Finally, in 2016, the Scottish government agreed to compensate Billy, but ruled out any serious default by the police or the prosecution service. What level of compensation he'll get, we've absolutely no idea. Uh, what they do is assess, obviously, what they feel has been the damage to, to you, uh, who you were prior to going to prison, what kind of work that you did, and an assessment's basically done on uh, that basis, uh, and they'll, they'll make a, a compensation uh, offer on that basis. Unfortunately for Billy, no amount of money will make up for the life he's lost. No, I always stuck by him. He deserves his good name back anyway, without anything else. And that's, that's what I would like to see. He's lost, I think, the respect of his peers and everybody in the in the gamekeeping world, that's a really hard one to swallow because Billy was a good gamekeeper. I ho I'm hoping at some point to get rid of all this, buy a couple of dogs again, get a nice wee place and just try and live my life as normal as I possibly can. I don't think I'll ever be normal again, but I've just got to try. I've just got to put it to the back of my mind. But it's, it's not easy. The Douglas and Angus estate where Billy worked have commented on the excellent relationship they had with Billy prior to his conviction, and they wish him well for the future and in reaching a satisfactory outcome. Since leaving custody, Billy has struggled to rebuild his life. And I should tell you that nobody else has been found guilty of this offence. Although rare, Billy's experiences are by no means the only example of serious miscarriages of justice.